A good, a good afternoon. This is the black man who reads aloud. And I'm honoring today Satchel Page. 37 years ago today, on June the 8th, 1982, Satchel Page passed away. I saw Satchel Page when I was a young boy when he played in the latter part of his career for the Cleveland Indians when he visited Memorial Stadium. That was the only time I ever saw Satchel Page pitch or saw Satchel Page in a uniform. But it is said that Satchel Page was the greatest baseball pitcher who, left, who ever lived during an age where Red Ruffing, Bob Feller, Walter Johnson, Carl Hubble, Bob Lemon, Early Wynn, Lefty Grove, and other white baseball players were able to apply their craft in the major leagues, the white major leagues. Pitchers like Joe Williams and Leon Day and Andy Cooper and Martin Diego and Bullet Rogan and Satchel Page had to apply their trades in the Negro Baseball League because baseball was at that time, segregated baseball players of color could not play in the major leagues. So today, I am going to read an article that was written by Larry Ty about Satchel Page, and I'm going to post it on my blog. As I said, Satchel Page to me was just the greatest baseball player who ever lived, and I wish I had been able to see Satchel Page pitch when he was a young lad, when he was in the prime of his career. But he was toiling on the back roads of America. And he would only uh, play white ball players in special exhibition games. And when he did that, he showed his flair. He showed his polish. He showed his greatness. Satchel Page threw his first pitch in professional baseball in 1926 for the Chattanooga White Sox, an inappropriately named team for the in the lower levels of the segregated Negro Leagues. He played his last game in organized baseball in 1966, a four, 40 years later for a Virginia club called the, uh, uh, <clears throat> for the Pilots that were playing around the Hampton area the Peninsula Pilots. In between, the Hall of Famer pitched more baseball and more ballparks for more teams than any player in history. It is also safe to say that no pitcher ever threw at a higher level for longer than the ageless right-hander with the whimsical nickname. Satchel entered the world as Leroy Robert Page. He was delivered at home into the hands of a midwife, which was more help than most poor women could afford in 1906. In Mobile, Alabama, he was born. His mother, Lula, was a washerwoman who had already spent her nights worrying how to feed and sustain the four daughters and two sons who had come before. Five more would follow. Leroy's father, John, alternated between the luxury and lilies and the garden that he tended uptown in the corner stoops on which he liked to loiter rarely making time to care for his expanding broad or brood. With skin the shade of chestnut and a birthplace in the heartland of the former Confederacy, the newborn Satchel's newborn prospects looked woeful, and they were about to get worse. For more than 200 years, Mobile had welcomed outsiders, Irish Catholics fleeing the phantom, Jewish merchants along with legions of Creoles, the free offspring of French or Spanish fathers and chattel mothers, and they in turn challenged the inbred thinking on everything from politics to race. The result during the post-Civil War period of Reconstruction was a blurring of the color lines in ways unthinkable in Montgomery, Alabama or Selma, Alabama, or most of Alabama, most of the rest of Alabama. Unfortunately for young Leroy, that live and let live mindset had finally begun fraying by the turn of the century and it unrivaled, unra- un- unrivaled entirely the first season of his birth when 
a local ordinance mandated separate seating on streetcars. Blacks were barred from most restaurants, cemeteries, saloons, hotels, and brothels. Whites and blacks were not allowed to attend the same school, marry one another, or play baseball on the same fields or green. Leroy Page was too young to understand those developments when they were reinforced every day he spent in his native city. Those first few years, I was no different than any other kid, he wrote a half century later. Only in Mobile was I a nigger kid. I went around with the back of my shirt torn, a pair of dirty diapers and raggedy pieces of trousers covering me. Shoes? They were someplace else. All the page kids knew by the age of six that they had to help put food on the table and in a good year, shoes on their feet. Leroy worked the alleyways like a pro, cashing in empty bottles he found there, delivering ice, also brought in small chains, but he was springing up like a weed in a bog, and so as he grew, so did Lula and John's expectations of his earning power. The obvious place to look for work was a nearby L and N station, where the pint sized porter polished the boots of wealthy white travelers or carried their bags to hotels like Mobile's luxurious battle house for as little as a dime. Realizing that he could not bring home a real day's pay if he made just 10 cents at a time, he got a pole and some rope and jerry-rigged a contraption that let him sling together two, three, or four satchels and caught them all at once. His invention quadrupled his income. It also drew chuckles from the other baggage boys. You look like a walking satchel tree, one of them yelled. The description fit him to a T and it stuck. Leroy Page, he said, became no more, and Satchel Page took over. His last name eventually was rewritten, too, from P-A-G-E to P-A-I-G-E. Page looked too much like a page in a book, his mother offered. Satchel had a more exotic explanation. My folks started out by spelling their name Page and later stuck the I in to make themselves sound more high-toned. While he played baseball as a boy, it was in reform school that he became a player. Two weeks before his 12th birthday, Satchel Page was sentenced to the Alabama Reform School for Juvenile Negro Lawbreakers. It was partly that he missed school so often. And at the l &N station, he stopped pulling and starting perlating suitcases along with anything else that was easy to grab. Now court officials were telling him that he... He would not see freedom again for six long years. It seemed like a bad dream until they shut the door on him. That's when he knew it was real. The good news was that his new home gave him endless time for his favorite pastime, pitching a baseball. There was a coach, too, Edward Byrd, who for the first time saw Satchel, the, taught Satchel the fundamentals, and for the first time, Satchel paid attention. Byrd's young protege had a autonomy uh, that was all up and down. Rising more than six feet and weighing barely 140 pounds, Satchel joked that if he stood sideways, you could not see him. His wiry arms and stilt-like legs were aerod aerodynamically perfect to propel a baseball from the mound to the plate. They gave him motion, momentum, strength, and he had the ideal launching pads, hands so huge that they made the baseball look like a golf ball with wrist that snapped with fury and the flash of a, a catapult. Bird understood what God had given this manful boy with his outsized appetites, limbs, and talents, and the coach was determined that it would not be squandered. He showed Satchel exactly how to exploit his storehouse of kinetic energy. The first thing was to kick his foot so high before unleashing the baseball that it blacked out the sky and befuddled the batter. Then the novice pitcher swung his arm far enough forward that it seemed like his hand was right in the batter's box when he let go of the ball. So was born the page pose, the look that over the decades made Satchel stand out from pitchers before and after. Left leg held skyward right arms stretched as far as it would go behind him, the catapult cocked to give the ball maximum power as he whirled forward to release it. The coach also showed him that physical, physical gifts were not all it took to win. Satchel had to outwit his opponent. 
Watch a batter's knees, bird of eyes, the way a bullfighter studies a bull, detect any weaknesses in the setup of his feet, his stance, the positioning of his bat, then put the ball where the slugger can hit it. Satchel was better at doing that than anyone who had ever come through the reform school. It was less his accuracy and more his velocity. Velocity. He threw hard. No curveball or slider, no change of pace or special finesse, not yet. Oftentimes, he often fell off the mound as he was letting go of the ball. He was as wild as young, and in tame pitchers often are. Sometimes his pitchers hit bad as he was letting go of the ball. As he was letting go of the ball, no, no, no. <clears throat> Excuse me. A baseball weighs just five ounces. It is a mass of cork wound from a woolen yarn and bound in cowhide, but flying off a satchel's finger that resembled a cannonball. Most who came to the plate failed to connect by what looked like a mile, and he kept getting better. The way Coach Bird would, said he could, looking back, Satchel said at the time, under Bird's tutelage, you might say I traded five years of freedom to learn how to pitch. The young hurler quickly put those lessons to work for a series of Negro League teams, starting with Chattanooga, progressing to bigger, better clubs in Birmingham, Baltimore, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Kansas City. The best available information suggests that he had an overall record in black baseball of 103 and 61 with 1,231 strikeouts and just 353 base on balls. Those numbers compiled for a study supported by Major League Baseball understate his dominance because he was not used in a conventional way. As the best drawing card in the American Leagues or in the Negro Leagues, he started often but might lead the game after three or four innings, which was too short of an appearance to be credited with a win, but long enough to be stuck with a loss. The records don't include those games bombstorming in small towns across the country the way he did between games and in seasons for more than 40 years, playing against sandliners, semi-pros, and many big leaders, big leaguers from California to the Caribbean, or playing for teams like the, like the one in Bismarck, North, Co North Dakota, where he managed a 35-2 and two mark over two seasons. Even the official Negro League games did not always produce records that were complete or reliable since black ball generally could afford neither statisticians or record keepers. Satchel Page defied the shadow and system by keeping his own record. He carried a notebook listing innings pitched, game scores, opponents, strikeouts, based on balls, and according to one sports writer who who said he saw it, a very important item to Satchel at the end of the gate. Sat the Satchel Almanac had him pitching in more than 2,500 games, winning 2,000 against, or winning 2,000 or so games. He professed to have labored for 250 teams and thrown 250 shutouts. His per-game strikeout record was 22 against Major League Barnstormers, which would have been an all-time record for all of baseball. Others claim that he would have set marks, 50 no-hitters, 29 starts in a month, 21 straight wins, 62 consecutive scoreless innings, 153 pitching appearances in a year, and three wins the same day. The numbers were, de were dizzying, but each required an asterisk explaining that Satchel kept his records the way he set them with flair, grace, and hoopla. The numbers changed as he added to his accomplishments, and yet another reporter wanted to peek at the books, each long for something new and daring as exclusive to impress the, their editors. None asked why the numbers of stories kept shifting. His tally of no hitters was as low as 20, as high as 100, and perhaps, no, perhaps most accurately, so many I disremember the number. The picture, the picture was equally muddled for shutouts, press actions, and statues offered opinions 200, 300, or 330. Sometimes he dished out a figure so outrageous he seemed to be testing whether his reader was paying attention, like when he wrote that he never batted less than 300 any season. His career Negro League average was 218. In the majors, it dropped to 
0 0.97, just when any serious statistician might be tempted to dismiss it as a rule. Close scrutiny suggests that much of it was true. Pitching 2,500 games seems inconceivable since the major league record holder, Jesse Orasco, managed just 1,252, but Orasco's numbers are just for the big leagues we pitched 24 years, starting every April and ending when he was lucky in October. Satchel's includes games played as a semi-pro and professional in the Negro Leagues on bomb storming tours in the Latin America and Canada, as well as the United States and in the major and minor leagues. He played spring, summer, fall, and winter. He often threw as many as three or four innings a game, but he did it every day or or two for 41 years. By that schedule, pitching 2,500 games amounts to slightly more than 60 games a year, which actually does not seem high enough. The same is true for other assertions. 100 no-hitters or even 20 looks dubious, concern, considering that Nolan Ryan, Ryan holds a major league record with just seven, followed, with, followed by Sandy Koufax with a mere four. But press accounts detail Satchel doing it against highly talented opponents like the all-black Homestead Graves, and it's easy to imagine him repeating the feat with relative ease and considerable frequency against standout teams he faced in his warfaring across the Western Hemisphere. His 2,000 wins would give him four times as many as Cy Young, whose name is attached to the award signaling baseball excellence. His calculation of career strikeouts would have bested Ryan, not by a hair, but by several thousands. Some pitchers were brilliant doing short runs at glory. Others made their names for durations uh, as much as dominance. Satchel Page excelled at both to the point where it was difficult to overstate all that he did or to dismiss even his most outrageous boast. Satchel Page's stats are clear when he finally made it to the majors, belatedly signed by Bill Veck in the summer of 1948 to pay for the Cleveland Indians. That milestone occurred on July 7th, Satchel's 42nd birthday. His earned run average for the remainder of the season, a measly 2.48, was second best in the American League. His performance over the half season he played so impressed the baseball, uh, nation, nation's baseball writers that when the association polled them, 12 voted for Satchel as Rookie of the Year in the American League, enough to place him fourth. He joked that he, if he had won the honor, he would have declined since I wasn't sure what year the gentleman had in mind. His 6-1 record was neither a joke nor an afterthought. It was the highest winning percentage on an outstanding Indian staff and a crucial factor in the team capturing the pennant, which it did by a single game over the Boston Red Sox. Each game he won had fans and writers marveling over what he must have been like in his prime and which other lines of black ball had been lost to the Jim Crow system of segregation. That was the best of his six seasons in the majors, two of which were with the Indians. Parts of three were with the old St. Louis Browns, along with one un unforgettable game with Charles O. Finley's A's of Kansas City. Satchel's record in the big leagues was just 28 and 31, with a 3.29 earned run average, mediocre, until you consider he was 42 when he launched his major league career in 59 years, two months, and eight days when he ended it with the Athletics in 1965. The f final appearance set a major league record that might not be broken. He was two years older than the runner-up, 33 more than his catcher that night, and Satchel seemed as old as the baseball itself when he shut out the hard-hitting Boston Red Sox for three innings. He needed 28, just 28 tosses to get nine outs. He struck out one and walked none over three innings. Batters popped up his pitches and tapped meek grounders. The only base hit was a double by Collier Strimsky, an all-star who had led the league in doubles that season and had seen his father hit against Satchel a generation earlier in a semi-pro game on Long Island. The denizens of baseball were impressed enough with that and all of Satchel's other achievements that they inducted him into the Hall of Fame in 1971, the first vintage Negro Liga to be voted into this exclusive club. Satchel's last years were quiet ones, uh, too quiet for the man who, who, who adored being on the mound in the middle of the action. 
Satchel last appeared on public on June 5, 1982 in Kansas City, where he spent most of his adult years and with his wife, Lahoma, raised seven children. The roar was gone from his voice as he wheeled closer to the microphone, an oxygen tube strapped to his face while his hand gripped the baseball. I hope the next time you come up, I can stand up, he said, hopefully, as the thin crowd stood in his honor. They were dedicating his name to a baseball stadium near his home. The base, the ballpark was as decrepit as the old ball player, weeds poking through the fresh grass and wind pouring through the breaches and the grandstand roofs. Friends who knew his condition had rushed to organize the naming ceremony, hoping it would lift the spirits. But it would take more than that. I am honored with the stadium being named for me. I thought that there was nothing left for me, he said. I've been in Kansas City 46 years, and I can walk down the street and people don't know me. Two years later, Kansas City was battered by a rainstorm that felled trees and knocked out power. Satchel woke that night with a headache. The next morning, the 8th of June, he could not find a comfortable position to lie or sit. His shoulder was throbbing. He had chills. Lahoma applied a hot water bottle and draped her jacket around him. Then she headed to the store for ice to keep food from spoiling during the outage. While she was going, Carolyn, their second oldest, found Satchel in a day. She fanned him. Daddy, Daddy, can you hear me? All he, all he could manage was, uh. His daughters called the paramedics, but their arrival was delayed by a fallen tree. In the meantime, Lahoma got home and tried to resuscitate Satchel using CPR she had learned as a nurse's aide. He was as limp as a dish rag, she said. His heart gave out for good in the ambulance, and he was pronounced dead at 1.15 p.m. at Truman Medical Center. In the days just before, he knew he was going to pass on. His wife recalled, we were trying not to talk about it. Looking back, we can see that it was more than his memorable pitching that formed that made Satchel stand apart and earned him a cherished spot, not just in the Hall of Fame, but in a, but in a Satchel statute that now graces its grounds. There also was his role as a racial pioneer role that got lost in his showmanship and bluster. Satchel pitched spectacularly enough during the era of segregated baseball, especially when the teams were beating the best of the white big leaders that white sport, sports writers turned out to watch black baseball. He proved that black fans would fill ballparks, even those parks that, that had concrete seats and makeshift walls, and that white fans would turn out to see black superstars. He barnstormed here and in the Caribbean alongside Dizzy Dean, Bob Fella, and other Caucasian champions, winning them over to him and to the notion that the Negro Leaguers could really play ball. He drew the spotlight first to himself and then to his Kansas City Monarch team and inevitably to the Monarch's rookie second baseman, Jackie Robinson. The truth is, is that Satchel Page had been hacking away at baseball's color bar uh, decades before the world got to know Jackie Robinson. Satchel laid the groundwork for Jackie the way A. Philip Randolph, W.E.B. Du Bois, and other early civil rights leaders did for Martin Luther King Jr. Page was a poster boy for black baseball as Louis Satchmo Armstrong was for black music and Paul Robeson was for the black stage. And as much as those two became symbols of their art in addition to their race, so Satchel was known not just as a great black pitcher, but a great pitcher. In the process, Satchel Page, more than anyone, opened to blacks the national pastime and forever changed the sport in this nation. As we look back on June 8, 1982, the day that Satchel Page, the greatest, I say, the greatest pitcher who ever picked up a baseball, passed away. Rest in peace, sir.